this is it right here. This is the pulse of music. I'm down with Kai, bro, too. I, I love what you guys do. Sweet, I will tune in for that, for sure. A record that reflected, you know, what I thought we did, and that was make, you know, heavy music. PJ Boy, what I, um, what I love to have that record released. Live from San Francisco, this is Kaius World Radio with your host, PJ Boston. Oh my fucking God, are you kidding me? Tonight is the night. And that's right. That's my good friend Lou up in paradise. And I am your host, PJ Boston. And this is Kaius World Radio number 58 we are normally broadcasting from the lovely confines of my home in south san francisco but tonight we have traversed the peninsula we have gotten out of our comfort zone we came right down to the middle of the chaos and mayhem to the nasty filthy shadowy subculture that they call south of market street in san francisco california that's right i'm your host pj boston and we are going to do this thing tonight This is a big one. We have on tap a phone call coming from Josh Homme. That's right. Josh freaking Homme is joining us tonight. And I can't even believe it. I was listening to some of the old interviews I did. I was listening to that Chris Goss interview I did earlier today. Man, this is going to be absolutely unbelievable. I'm also joined by my good friend, Antho. Antho. Get about a fist from that microphone and say, what's up? Hey, yo, what's up? Anthony is in the house. Man, you've never been to the show before, have you? Nope. First time. Uh, you played metal in the uh, outside here uh, uh, in the in the foyer or whatever this is with Jack Chap, but you've never been in the studio, huh? <laughs> nope. Wow. So Anthony is the biggest Queens of the Stone Age fan I know. He's sitting in the house tonight. He's also a new dad. He can't wait to say hi to Josh. I can't wait to say hi to Josh. I want to shout out to Kristen. She's going to make all this happen. But here's what we're going to do. It's the 25th anniversary of And the Circus Leaves Town, one of the greatest albums released ever. Top 25 album in the history of music, period. And we're going to talk to Josh Homme. It's going to be unbelievable. You know how we do it. We're also going to have a little chat with our good friend Nathan Lover uh, in the second hour. We're going to play And the Circus Leaves Town in its entirety. And you know i got to pull this thing down and let it rip because Josh Homme is going to be on Caius World Radio.
That was fucking trippy. on stage it just went up it just was like a flash of green light and that was it well you know dozens of people spontaneously combust each year it's just not really widely reported right. yeah
tell you two about dealing in front of the store. Now drop the kid and pedal your wares someplace else, burn boy.
we're smoking dog shit, man. Oh man, that is so much Kai's World Radio. I got to turn that down. Let me figure this thing out. All right, so this is going to be awesome. <laughs> I am uh, PJ Boston. We are broadcasting live from San Francisco. This is Kai's World Radio, number 58. We are being joined right now by the man, the myth, the legend, one of the biggest rock stars I've ever talked to and one of the coolest dudes ever, Mr. Josh Homme. Josh, welcome to Kai's World Radio, my friend. Thank you, PJ. How are you? I'm excellent, man. So, uh, Thank you so much. Uh, for joining us, first off, uh, I know it's not that easy to uh, to, oh. to 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 pin you down because uh, you're amazing. <laughs> so thank you for joining us. Oh, let me get well, my. I, I I would say the same thing actually. You know, um, uh, my buddy Scott Reader told me that um, that the Kai's World folks, all the fans, had uh, that that you guys existed and that um, you guys actually fixed the Sky Valley sign and. Um, is that is that true? That is true. Yeah, they they were uh, we were planning a big get together during uh, Stone and Dusted 
last year we were going to get together and we were going to see if we could um, take a big picture at the sign. We've done it a few years in a row now. And uh, some dudes decided they were going to try to wreck our photo op. And they apparently they attached the sign to the back of the pickup truck or something, and they tried to rip it out of the ground. But a bunch of a bunch of Australians were already in town, and a bunch of people, Jason Hall and Daniel Hoffman, and they went and fixed that fucking thing. They had it. It's like stronger now than it ever has been. So, well, you know, every once in a while I run into somebody, and they're like, "We tried to take the sign, or it's really very desert to hook it up to your truck and try to drive away." That's and, some silly um, shit. Um, but I just want to tell you and, and and whoever helped and and you know I don't do a lot of social media. I sound like uh, I'm doing a Dos Equis commercial. Uh, I don't I don't I don't drink beer, but when I do, um, uh, finding out that you guys existed really kind of meant the world to me because um, you know Caius was a band of four fans and there wasn't that many when it existed. And I really feel like uh, it's owned by fans now, Caius, and it's what's kept it alive. And so I'm really glad to, to uh, be talking to you. And I was really, I was really touched by that story. You know? Oh yeah, that's a. I mean, how cool is that? They got that thing right back up and running. So now, Josh, tell me, where are you at right now physically? Are you in the desert? Are you in India? Where are you at? Right now, I'm in Los Angeles. Yeah. Okay, so you live in LA. You spend most of your time there. I spend most of the time in L.A., you know, once your kids go to school, um, you kind of live where they go to school. Yeah, that makes sense. Now, uh, yeah. how about the, how you doing with quarantine? We were actually going to try to do this in March, and then the shit hit the fan, and I'm so glad we were able to finally put it together. But how you doing with all this bullshit? Um, you know, I, I, I really think that uh, there's a lot of, I, I suppose it's how you look at it. I, I'm trying to always look for the silver lining and, um, in something like this, um, it's allowed me to spend a lot of time with my family. I, I'm kind of a workaholic, and it's made me um, rethink what's important, you know. And and, I, and in my own way, I feel that I feel like the world needed to slow down a little bit and just take a breath. And uh, this certainly is that, you know. Uh, it's obviously fraught with danger, like physically, mentally, and I suppose. <laughs> money wise for the world you know people working and all that um but um it's really allowed me to, to spend time with my family and, and uh slow down and so i've been trying to focus on those things that i like in that realm you know um how's it been for you you know it's been tough i i run a my day job i run a place that sells food and i was kind of like an essential worker and i had to uh kind of I took a few days off here and there but we had to kind of figure it out and and it's a whole different world to be in but it's you know it's tough every day with the masks and the clean you know keeping everything clean all the time and it's just a it's a different world like you said and it's uh but I'm with you I feel like it needed to slow down a little bit and I am enjoying certain aspects of not going crazy all the time if that makes any sense so right and it's tough it's tough because you're you're it seems like you're pressed between versions of crazy cuz you know as you stay in one place and, um, you know, being in it, the walls get a little tighter every day, you know? Yeah. Um, and so you have to find ways that you wouldn't have tried before. So, um, yeah, I think there's, there's certainly a lot of downside, but, um, I'm certainly trying to look for the upside. I bet you, I, can. I bet you're not missing all those airports and all that travel all the time, huh? Well, I mean, I think, uh, you know, I always, um, once we start, uh, once I put something out, I always feel like really obliged to go everywhere and make sure that we sort of represent, you know? Right. And and sometimes even when I was exhausted, you know, and and uh, so at the moment I'm I'm enjoying not having to do that, you know. I think I think the the best thing about going the best thing about going away for a while is, is the chance to reemerge, but you do need to go away in order to do that, you know? Well, that makes me wonder about you, because you have reemerged so many times with so many different things going on. What, I wasn't going to do this till uh, later in the interview, but do you have any, uh, at all, any clue of how it might look when you guys uh, can venture back out, or, or right now it's just so far in the woods that maybe, maybe, maybe it's tough to see that far? No, I think if you back, I, I think if you back up a little, um, 
there's a strange bubble level that you try to find, especially in this moment. I think um, I've been doing a lot of charity things, you know, because awesome. there's so much um, need. Yeah, people and need stuff. Yep. Yeah, it's everything so topsy turvy. Things you didn't expect to be in danger are, um, and um, and also I think in its own way, while music is the thing that sort of sa- has always saved me, and I think it really helps people get through rough times. By the same token, a major thing of what I do, which is going to play, is really going to be the last thing to be sort of switched on again. And and I don't like supporting the idea of playing somewhere where people are standing apart because it's the opposite reason. And I, I fear ideas like that, you know? Yeah, I'm with where, you. I want to get back to normal, so, but it could be a while, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah, and I think, you know, um, but it certainly makes you think of what would be something, I guess the, the easiest question is like, what, what? okay, what's an alternative that's just cool that you really like? <laughs> the alligator so, hour so, is cool. <laughs> Yeah, it, it was it was fun to to do that some more, um, and I enjoy doing that. Um, I've done so many of them that sometimes I, I think, oh God, what a, what's there to play? But then it really gets me. I, I think you you're DJing here too, and it's, it gets you to listen to music and really focus on music for a second. Yeah. Um, sometimes making it, I forget to listen to it. Well, that's uh, interesting because I was going to segue right into the you know the fact of the matter. I mean. 25 years ago, yesterday, they released your final Caius album in the Circus Leaves Town. Wow. I know, I mean, wow. that sounds crazy, right? 25 years? Yeah, wow. That's amazing. I, 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 uh, I, uh, I'm, not a, I'm not good at keeping, um, you know, memorabilia, or, or I, I'm not too nostalgic because uh, I guess it makes me feel a little sad sometimes. And I feel like there's such a huge pile of things to do. And sometimes I feel like when I look at a picture or something, I, I, I go, man, that's, it'll never be that. That's only what it was. And so I tend to focus forward, you know. But by the same token, uh, hearing that that's 25 years old makes me, uh, it makes me, that makes me happy, you know. Uh, makes me a little bit proud, you know, that, that I got to do something that long ago. That I'm not dead yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I should shout out Nathan Lover, the founder of Caius World. Um, everyone knows Nathan. He's always maintained, uh, and the Circus Leaves Town is his favorite album of all time. He loves that record. Anthony, my uh, my right hand man, has got his hands in the air. He's he's a huge and the Circus Leaves Town guy. Um, but man, uh, let me ask you about that album. I'm going to ask you a few questions about that. First off, the name. Did you? Was that name chosen because did it seem like Caius was coming to an end at that time, or was there another reason, or how'd that name come out? Well, um, where do I start? Um, you know, Caius was started uh, when you're with the childhood friends, you know, and as you start to play, you play as the sort of musketeers, you play for each other. And then as you sort of grow, and, and or I, I guess I can, I, I can only speak for myself, but as you play, you realize the religion of music, and in particular just the luxury of being where we're from, which we had no, was not responsible to us. It was already existed where you had to play. You couldn't, like things like fame or money, that's not, they didn't exist. So you never played for that reason. You played for sort of respect and to sound different and to, to sort of articulate and play the sonic version of what makes you different, you know? Like how do, if, if 99% of what we are, you and I are the same, that's how we, that's how we sort of unite together and, and, and sort of relate to each other. But there's that 1% that makes you different and that makes me different. And I, I think early on we were sort of guided um, uh, that... Music is about um, amplifying that one percent that makes you different, and trying to find out how do I sound like unlike anybody else, you know. Um, and and I also think we were so young. There's a certain like arrogance there and an innocence there 
where you're playing from such an idealistic perspective, you know. Um, it really was like a religion. By, by the time we were doing, uh, before we did Circus, after the Sky Valley tour, we were rehearsing six days a week for about eight or nine hours a day. And we were playing the same songs five times in a row, but playing them different all five times, trying to figure out how to turn them inside out and and make them retain the, that sense of self, what makes that song, but also be able to jam them and move them around, you know? And uh, it was very intense. It kind of came from that Black Flag SST ethos, you know, that really uh, educated the desert where I'm from. Um, and so, um, you know, I think the way Brant left Sky Valley was, was a real shock. Um, and it was very much like the rug being pulled out from under you, you know, because I, I didn't really understand. And, and he was never able to make it really clear because I think it's difficult too, you know, to, uh, when you're young like that, it's like, it's difficult to say, I need to go this direction. And, um, so when he left, one of the things that he had said was, um, when he left, he had a, our manager tell us that he was leaving, right? And so we didn't really get to speak to Brant. And one of the things that he had said was, I think the band should be over, you know? And I really loved Brant, and, and I think those were, that was like a difficult moment to hear that your friend was gone and that he wasn't explaining why and that he thought it should be over, you know what I mean? And... One, one aspect that I always agreed with is that bands, especially at that time, I was adamant, like, bands shouldn't go on too long. When, at the time, I really felt like um, you do your best work, and when you realize you've done your best work, that's when you should explode the band. <laughs> like, to preserve it is to destroy it, you know? So that you end at the absolute apex of your creativity as a group of people. And... For me, personally, and I probably should have shared this, but in my gut, I was like, we'll do one more record, and it will be everything we have, you know? And so when I suggested that title, I think I knew that that was it, you know? Makes sense. Or I, I felt that it was coming to a close, and just felt very sort of, you know, Edgar Allan Poe or... <laughs> it felt like something wicked this way comes. It's one of the beautiful titles I've ever seen, you know, for a book. Right. And uh, it's just got this beautiful, ominous darkness to it. And so, and the circus leaves town just felt sort of timeless. And like it's it's over. And you watch you watch it exit on the horizon. Just these silhouettes exit on the horizon. You know. Wow, that's beautiful. That's a very long. That's, that's yeah. a very long. Answer. No, but that makes sense. And and you know, you mentioned six days a week, eight hours a day. You guys are turning these songs in and out. Would you say it's possible that in the Circus Leaves Town was maybe the most collaborative album, where everyone had equal hands in in all the different stuff you guys were doing? Well, um, I think what we had was um, an incredible. I was like in. Um, being in a band to being on a, a pirate ship, you know, you go from town to town, giving as much as you can, taking as much as you can. And when you're out on the open sea together, um, you know, people always think the captain is the most important role, but if the rigor fails, you die. If the cook fails, you die. If the captain fails, you die. They're all equally important. The only thing that's not good is role envy. If the cook wants to be the captain, wants to be the rigor. And so what I think is really beautiful is that we, I felt we really had all these, everyone was proud of their, the roles that we had. And I think that's a really beautiful thing. Um, I think, as I said, the only thing that is not good is if somebody, you know, when you're in a band relationship, this is where I, the, that lineup uh, of Caius with Alfredo and Scott and John and myself, that's where I really started to feel comfortable about saying, look, we're going to play a game of one type or another. Why don't we play the game where you say what you want and I'll do the same and you don't do it in a 
cruel or egocentric fashion. You just say what you need and what you'd like to do, and then we'll talk about it and try to make that real. And collaboration really should be moving at the speed of inspiration because who's to say if somebody has 10 ideas but somebody else steps in and has one idea that makes it just explode into light, you know? And so I think the value of collaboration is recognizing that you do the best idea available to you, you know, um, regardless of who comes up with it, you know? Because I think for Circus, I had tons of ideas, but I think those guys really added these things that really put it over the top. And I think also we put some demands on John, like you need to get involved in that writing process more. Because I think John um, enjoyed sort of, he, he, he was, he enjoyed, um, you know, saying, having, having Brant or I or, or Scott as it went say, hey, I got this idea and it goes like this. I think that's beautiful too, you know. Um, it's all about if you appreciate that, that role that you're in. And, um, and I think everyone, as I said, really sort of, we were very symbiotic at that point. Wow. That's heavy stuff, Josh. You, um, you ever listen to Caius anymore? Like, uh, on a regular basis? I listen to every record at least once a year. Uh, do you, if you, and this might not be possible, but you, do you have a favorite Caius record? Um, you know, it's changed over the years. Uh, a lot of, I will say a lot of the time, Circus is one of my favorites. I, I, I really think the best thing we ever did was the final thing we did because it was so raw and it was such, uh, the final thing we did was a, was a seven inch or a man's room that had a song called Fat So Forgot So and Flip the Phase and Shine and um, I think one was called Mudfly. And it's four tunes, but they were recorded, they're like all one one take, everybody playing and singing, like no overdubs. Just real. Right, I think we did Into the Void too. Um, mm -hmm. And they're all, you know, within the first couple takes, the entirety of the take. And all done on mushrooms and mixed on mushrooms. And so it's like this, it was like a straight pipeline of what we exactly were and, and what we'd kind of learned. It really, for me, was the apex of where we were at. There's a, there's, there's a song called Faso Forgato that feels like, maybe it's just because I've been watching Apocalypse Now lately, but it felt, it felt like victory. <laughs> you know? I, I literally just watched it a couple weeks ago, me and my lady. We were we were living through that. Well, you just mentioned Man's Ruin. I was actually gonna uh, chat with you a little bit about that. You know, um, you know that that split was released on Man's Ruin back at the end of eight, uh, '97, and you know, rumor has it that Frank Kozik was one of the ones who maybe suggested what turned into the enduring kind of like desert sessions that you guys have done. Um, you know, kind of getting off of uh, of of the Caius. Um, oh, it was Frank's idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and. And Frank is not only yeah. an, an amazing artist, but he's super well respected, and he's been around for so long. Tell me about your relationship with Frank, because he's amazing. Um, you know, uh, and but before I do that, I would say it's impossible to deny Sky Valley, and and I really loved collaborating with with Brant. You know, I've sin I have since learned that he had his own feelings that he wasn't able to really share properly. You know, and um. But I, I always loved working with Brant and collaborating with Brant and felt like we were brothers. We'd known each other since we were six, you know. Um, and so I really, it's impossible to pick a favorite record because also then there's Blues with Nick and that's the first time that we sounded on record the way we sounded live, you know. So I really, I, it'd be difficult to pick at the end of the day. As for... Frank, um, you know, I really didn't. I really didn't know who Frank was at the time. Um, I, I had this sort of deliberate habit of trying not to be influenced, you know, 
when when people first said, you guys sound like Black Sabbath, I was always proud to be able to say, like, I've never heard Black Sabbath, you know? And, and I think when you're young like that and you're kind of cocky and you're naive and when you're really trying to make your own way, it feels good to shirk influences. I mean, now that would never matter to me like it did then, you know? Because I, at the time, I, I really I didn't want someone to be able to sa- say we sounded like anything. But people aren't saying you you know you you sound exactly like this band. They're just they're trying to relate, you know. And, right. But I think at the time, I was really I wanted to shirk any of those um, any similarities to anybody, you know. And so when Frank, when I when I met Frank, um, I just heard there's this cool artist in San Francisco, and he's starting his own label and I wanted the freedom, you know, I wanted to be able to, so much of the time I, when Caius was playing, we really weren't liked by that many fans or like dealing with record labels like Electra and all this stuff was impossible because I think if you're going to do something that's a little different um, and you present that idea to some people, you, you present that idea, nine out of 10 people are going to think it's terrible. <laughs> The idea, especially without hearing it, you know. And I would always think, yeah, because it's a different idea, you know. Of course you're not going to get the idea. That's the point. If everyone got it, it wouldn't be a different idea, you know. Makes and makes perfect those, sense. Those always, what's that? I said it just makes perfect sense, exactly. Right, and so it's frustrating for me that someone would say, I don't get it, and then, you know, sort of look at you like, so what are you going to do to make me get it? I was like, you're not supposed to get it, you know. There's, you'll get it when you hear it, or you won't, but that also means it's different, too. And I think there was like, there's a little bit of safety in, and when you're, there's a little bit of safety in saying, you just don't get it, man, um, that you sort of need to erode as you go, you know? It's okay to do that in the beginning. You just don't understand me. That's why you don't like it, you know? Um, and I think you get to a point where you say, I love it, and so what can I do about what somebody else feels? But I know that if I truly love it, someone else has a greater chance of feeling that same way. You know? So by the time I met Frank, I drove up there to meet Frank. And, uh, um, and of course, he asked us to cover Into the Void, but I was like, of course, Black Sabbath. And that was the first time I'd ever heard Black Sabbath was hearing Into the Void. Wow. And... I really didn't want to do it <laughs> um, because I felt uh, because people had compared us to Black Sabbath, and I liked not giving into that at the time. But I guess I sort of felt like I didn't know Frank, and I thought, well, this is probably a condition. And I thought if 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 he'll put it, if he wants to put out into the void, and I say no, maybe it won't happen because I really didn't know him very well. And you got to remember, I was like twenty, twenty, maybe almost twenty-one. And so you're still sort of wondering how far you can push something at that time, you know? And so we agreed to do it because um, it was kind of, we could do these other songs and we kind of had full autonomy. And we were such a well-oiled machine at that point, you know? Um, and so I kind of jumped at the chance. It was something that we could actually do. And, and, uh, and it turned out really well and it became sort of the beginning of what was a really good relationship for a number of years with Frank. Yeah, everybody loves Frank. He's Yeah, he's, he's, and it felt good to be the, the band that really put his label on the map, you know? Yeah, that's awesome. It's just one of those moments that worked on both sides. And, and at the time, there were underground scenes, you know? Nowadays, it's, it's, it's extremely difficult because, you know, of um, everything being online, people... People revel in ruining a uh, secret by telling, you know? Right. And before, it felt like we're all huddling over a little fire, and, and everyone has to tend to that fire, and that fire is the senior. And, and now it's sort of like the 17 most secret beaches in California. And it's like, you motherfucker, you just told you just, everybody. You wrecked it. I'm with you. And, yeah, and so wrecking it, or dry humping it, is, <laughs> is like... Is, 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 a, is a bizarre form of appreciation. I ruin it because I love it, you know? Yep. And, um, again, I would re- reiterate that I was looking for a way to 
explode Caius so that it would be locked in amber forever like a mosquito from a million years ago. You know, that it would be preserved at its apex. You know? Well, it's worked. Because it's worked so far. Well, I, mean, I, think, I think the... Uh, the the point being is that it's so fragile, it's so difficult and impossible to actually. At that point, we realized there was a theme that was actually starting between sleep and uh, monster magnet, you know, and then later Fu Manchu, you know, and that there was something going on, um, but that really didn't start happening till the very end, like the last six months of guys. There was no. I mean, we'd play across the country, and, and, <laughs> and you know, you'd end a song, and you'd hear someone go, I hate you. <laughs> yeah. well, and that would be it. And, and it was, so it was, it was interesting, you know. I bet. It's, it's, but, uh, I'll tell you what, sorry, I, saw, I, I saw you guys at Bottom of the Hill in 1995, and it was packed. Right. And you guys were loud as fuck, and you guys changed my life. And you're right, that scene, nowadays, people would just figure that out with their phones and their social media. Um, but back well, then, back I, then, if you wanted to see that, you had to go see it. Well, you, 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 you were proud to actually commit the time and the energy because that's what it takes to water plants or like make good food or fall in love with somebody. <laughs> you know, what I mean? it's, it takes it when you have someone's time and energy, you have their attention and they're engaged and you can fall in love. You know what I mean? And you're proud of something because you, People don't appreciate what they get for free because they didn't do anything to get it, and how can they do anything but abuse it? But when they put in the time and energy, they cherish that thing. Like, I got my first leather jacket. I'd worked for fucking months. I loved that thing. You know what I mean? I just, it was too hot to wear it in the desert, but I didn't give a fuck. I just wore the shit out of that thing. And I, and I think um, at that time, in particular for us, San Francisco was a good city because San Francisco had enough dirt and grime with an open mind and was sort of loosey goosey and was like, show me something I haven't seen. And so they were just, they had that open mindedness. And I think um, there were possibilities in music that are different now. You could, you could, there were all sorts of sub genres and sub scenes and things like that. And it felt really, really cool to accidentally have something that you were like, I think we sound different, you know? Um, I mean, I remember tuning down for the first time and being like, this is the one thing I haven't heard anybody do. And, um, you know, and feeling like this is, this is how I will sound like myself. And nobody does this. You know, you know, Josh, and I, now there's now there's seven string guitars, and I'm like, oh shit! Yeah, what the fuck I is hope that? I have nothing to do with that. You know? But but, uh, but that's interesting because I did want to ask you about that. We had uh, the 25th anniversary of Sky Valley uh, a couple years back, and we had talked to um, or last year. We had talked to Chris Goss, and um, right, he um, he laid out this whole eloquent, beautiful scene where he met you guys for the first time, and he talked about how his wife had been playing him this tape that she had of some demos or something you guys had um and before we get too far into chris he says that you were tuned down uh as low as c or lower than c but not quite b and he said literally this is a quote he said there's like a quarter tone in josh's head that he follows and then the rest of the band tunes to him is that correct no 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 tuners no nothing um, you know, I, it's like um, everyone was working class, and if you wanted a tuner, you had to buy one, and you had to go to work and get a job. And but buying amps and like, you know, it's like, uh, it, so I I was like, I'll take the strings to flappy, and then I'll go up till it feels right on my right hand, and that's where we'll sit. And it's it's somewhere hovering around B. Wow. And it is, it's like maybe 25 cents off. I mean, but we didn't have tuners, so it's always wiggling and adjusting. And then everyone tuned. Every Kai show started with me tuning, then tu- Chris, you know, Chris or Nick tuning to me, and then we play. Wow. And, you know, I, I, I the, that epiphany of saying, I went away for the summer. And, you know, we're talking like I'm 13 years old here, you know. And I remember being like, feeling like in my heart and in my gut that 
what I wanted to hear was like this this thing that almost sounds like it's far away and on the other side of a wall, you know, just this low rumbling machine. And, you know, for me, visualization is a lot, means a lot. Like that notion of looking at the desert over at a hill and here they come, the silhouettes over the crest of the horizon. Like I want to sound like that looks in, in my mind, you know. And tuning down, discovering, like realizing, because I only had polka guitar lessons. It's like nowhere to start for rock and roll. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> Drop tune Although polka. I've incorporated polka into everything. It's like you hear no one knows or things like that. And it's, it's polka. That's you know? funny. I mean, essentially, it's like boom, boom, you know. Right. But, but um, realizing um, when someone tells you it's a rule because they're hiding something, I don't want you to do what's on the other side of that wall. And so enjoying infiltration of rules, like tell me what the rules are so I know how to go. I'm not going to do any of them. I just need to know where you are so I can go around you. Anywhere but here, sort of a philosophy, you know. It felt really good. It felt like taboo, you know. So you hadn't heard, any, like, you, you hadn't heard anything uh, real low that kicked you into overdrive. You just felt this thing in your hand where you wanted the strings at a certain tension. And well, there there was no such thing. Right. I mean, what 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 else soon to be or see at that time? I, I'm right. I'm not aware of anything. Yeah, no, I'm with you. To, to this day, I'm not aware of anything. I know I hear I I know that Sabbath ended up tuning to D, um, but I didn't learn that till after Kai's was over. Yeah, Neil, Neil Young used to do some D. The, some people did, but. Yeah, that's. I'm, you're, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure there's all kinds of evidence of someone dropping the low string or an open chords, and, and I'm certainly not saying that no one has ever played around like that. Yeah, but no I one just knew that. No one ever made it like, sound like you guys. <laughs> that's well, for sure. Well, that was, but that was the thing. It's like for a moment we wore our influences on our sleeves. I was so into the misfits and the melody and the difference of it, and and. That first Danzig record was, there was no punk rock anymore. It was like, they looked like thugs in the cover of that first record, you know, like street hoodlums. And, uh, and so I think when you're 16, you wear your influences on your sleeve, right? Yeah. And so the worst thing that could ever happen in the desert happened. Because when we were 14 and we were in Cats and Jammer and it was tuned down <coughs> a little bit, um, or no, it was regular tuning. And then I came back to the summer and we were going to, we were looking for a name, and we were, and things had changed. And I said to Brant, like, I got this thing, man. And, you know, um, something happened where people in the desert, they don't pay for music, so instead of booing or something, you hear nothing when the song is over. <laughs> like crickets. And it's your friends. <laughs> so um, it's the worst feeling of all time. <laughs> or if someone says, you guys sound like this. And I remember saying, I'll never let anyone say we sound like anything ever again. Because it hurt at the time when you're 16. Um, you sort of let that go as time goes on. But in that moment, that's the fuel you run your tank on. That's what I did. And so it was like we dropped down and we, and also just trying to sound heavy and different than the other bands in the desert outside. Outside, the sound isn't bouncing off of anything. It's just going and going and going. You know, five miles away, you hear the band because the sound's coming right at you. And so how do you sound big in an environment where there's no echo? That, you know, you're not, it's not contained like a big speaker box. And that was the way. Just drop that shit down. That makes sense. You know, when I was talking to Chris Goss about, uh, about Sky Valley and we were talking about the, um, the first time that he ran into you guys in L.A. and, and when he knew that he needed to try to get you guys... Um, uh, you know, working with him and when he brought you to Sound City and all that, uh, he mentioned in passing that he thought it was possible that your dad might have introduced you to one of the discs of the Master of Reality, one of the first albums that they had or whatever. D do you recall any of that? Did your dad turn you on to Masters of Reality? No. Uh, you know, I knew his wife, Cynthia, because she worked with this guy that was helping manage us. They worked at uh, Warner Chapel publishing and you know at that time you worked you have a music business job that was like working in the office that wasn't 
sort of high up, but you were everyone was always scouting around for bands. You know, I mean, that was part of the thing. It was a it was a way for in that environment that they were working in to sort of jump up by finding somebody. And Cynthia was just a a rocker all through and through. And she was married to Chris, and and so um, I guess Ron, his name is Ron Crown. He turned on Cynthia to what was our first record, Wretch, which was really a compilation of demos. And we'd had a lot of trouble recording because we'd go record and you go in the studio and someone says, you can't use bass cabinets and bass heads for amps. You can't tune down that low. You can't. It was just, you can't, you can't, you can't. It was like, this isn't right. And when you're 16, you're like, fuck. Like, what do you mean? What are we going to do? Right. <laughs> You know, you kind of accidentally treat them like your parents or some other authority figure. It's, there's, you have to grow through that shit. And so we'd never been allowed to record as we sounded until Blues for the Red Sun. So I met Chris. We had a terrible habit of if someone in L.A. would give a shit, we'd fight them, you know, <laughs> And which is stupid. But, you know, when you're 16, 17, 18, in the Des, you know, that's if someone said something, you fought them. You didn't. You didn't talk back and forth, you know? And so we played at this place called the Opium Den. Um, and it's a really little place for a record release party for this band, Fear of God. And they played for a really long time. It was their record release party, but we were sort of <laughs> insulted by that. And, you know, I used to make fake IDs, so um, we were hanging out in this bar, but we're only 16, 17 years old. And we were getting drunk as 17 year olds do like foolishly. And so they played for so long that we kind of, when we got on stage, we talked a little shit and then ended up beating up this band, you know, during the show. <laughs> and that's how I met Chris. <laughs> that is awesome. Um, he, he watched us like mop the floor with this band, you know? Um, and you know, it's funny now and it was, <laughs> it was funny then, but it's, it's not, it's acting like, a bunch of blockheads is, you know, is not the way to go through life. So. Well, it is if you're meeting Chris Goss. That's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I think we had an extreme distaste for L.A. And we were young with chips on our shoulders. And people outside of, in our hometown, people dug us. And we'd leave and people would be like, what the fuck is this? It's too low. It's too this. It's too that. You got a chip on your shoulder, and if you're drinking on a Thursday night at 17, when you should be, you know, going to school the next day, and someone says something to you, if you're from my hometown, you just deck them, you know. That is so old and, school. That's awesome. Yeah, I, <laughs> it, it is what it is, you know. Well, you know, Josh, your your sound, your heavy down tuned sound, and your equipment is like legendary, and we could spend an hour talking about all your rig and all that stuff and everything. But I do have one question about your stuff. When I saw you, you were playing an ultra GP and yeah. I, kn I know that was, um, you know, that we, we all know the history of that. There's only a couple hundred of them on the planet. They only made a few of them. My question is, where'd you get your hands on that ultra GP? And like, how'd you end up playing that thing? What, what was the story with that? Every summer since I was a little boy, the day school would get out. I would get picked up and we would drive to Northern Idaho and we would, stay there in the woods in a little town called Sandpoint, which is only about 3,000 people on this lake, Lake Pondre, and, um, and stay there, and we would drive home, and I'd get home like a day or two before school started again. You know, I was a little kid, and that happened basically until I was about 18 years old, until my senior year in high school, and, and um, I was, you know, once I heard punk rock at like 10 years old, I was hooked because it was something I could do and it was mine. It was something I felt uh, an ownership of and a kinship of and like I understood it and I felt like it understood me. And uh, Black Flag was one of the few bands that actually played in the desert and, and because they did and because they had such a message of start your own label, do your own thing, sound like yourself, it became like law, you know, in the desert, sound like yourself, which is a really great influence. It wasn't sound like Black Flag, it was sound like yourself. And really, that was really propagated by a guy named Boomer, Mario Wally. He was, he is responsible for the desert sound. He is the one that sort of gently, lovingly pushed this mandate. Like, it's like, I'm putting it into law, but I'm doing it with such a gentle hand. And 
he's the one that encouraged us when I was like 13 playing at his house. You know, everyone hated it. And he was like, no, 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 you're on, you're, you're doing your thing. Do your thing. Which is such a gift to, to receive from a, somebody when you're that young. Um, and, you know, I loved Greg Ginn so much. His style was just impossible. And he had that Dan Armstrong guitar and it was his and you knew it. And if you said Dan Armstrong, anyone would say, Greg Ginn. And you watch this guitar disintegrate over time. It ended up needing to be taped. And, and over the years, it's just like disintegrating, but it was his. And so I went to this music store that sold vinyl in Sandpoint, Idaho. And there was a banjo, an acoustic guitar, and that ovation. And I just wanted a guitar that was shaped cool that I knew nobody else had. And this guitar happened to be that. It wasn't for any other reason at all. There's no, it's not because I knew anything. It's not because um, I had some kind of any other idea. It just, I knew, here's a guitar I've never seen that's not a, um, that's sort of off brand. I didn't know what Ovation was, you know. Like, because I knew nothing about it, I thought, well, no one else will know anything about it either, you know. And so it was really just fate. And I, I never even had another one of those till the very end of Kai's. I, I managed to get my hands on maybe two, three more, maybe. Or no, it was, I actually was in Queens on the first Queens record. Do you uh, do you still like, have Do you still have them? Um, I do, and I actually I gave one. There's a gal that, um, you know, last year uh, who's got terminal, you know, um, cancer and of the family and the husband and he had to sell his guitar. So I just gave him one, Wow! you know, Damn. and if they wanted to sell it, you know, I mean, I don't know that it's worth anything particularly. Um, but I said, take this and sell it and, and, or keep it. And he, he kept it, you know, um, cause I really only played the one guitar, the black one. And yeah, I guess I was really kind of aping that Greg Ginn thing by just saying, if you see this guitar, you know who it is. Because I always had this dream, you know, this goal that that you should be able to tell it's me in two seconds or I fucked up. You know? <laughs> that, that was that's what I was hoping for. That's what I was trying for, you know. And and at the end of the day, I was okay with in two seconds I know that's you and I hate it. <laughs> I'm okay I'm okay with that too. It's just that um, to be able to be identifiable um, is the goal when you, if you play music, you know. Well, you are certainly um, identifiable, that's for sure. Well, I, th- I think, I think in, a, in a strange way, maybe that's the minimum obligation, is that if you're blessed enough to play for a living, then the minimum obligation is that you should be able to stand out and be recognizable for what you do. Like, that's what you're supposed to do. You're not supposed to, like... You're not supposed to blend, you know. Um, but that's maybe a disservice, and maybe a, thinking about it wrong. If you if you intend to blend, it makes a lot of sense. You know, you you mentioned Boomer, and um, you know, there's no getting around the fact you guys covered No and Catamaran. You know, uh, tunes by Across the River and Yawning Man, respectively. Um, you know, you said you you knew. Mario, when you were 13, tell me about that relationship that you guys had. He he was the he, you know, I, one of the first people I ever had on this show was Mike Mike Johnson, Mike Pygmy, and Mike told me that he was running through the neighborhoods in Mecca Vineyards with his gear uh, because the party was so big that the streets were blocked with cars. But Mario stopped him and said, "You have to come to Rhythm and Bruise," and 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 took a moment to really go out of his way to invite Mike down. And and so many people have told me so many stories about Boomer. What do you got about Boomer? Well, what I would say is that um, things always emanate from somewhere, and as they travel outward, passion dissipates as it goes, right? And I would say Mario is the passionate source for all things desert music. Um, there are people that wish it was them, <laughs> you know? Right. And there are people that understand implicitly nobody gave more and asked for less. Nobody gave more and took less. Even though Mario should have 
gotten more, you know, I think, as I said, people don't appreciate what they get for free, and Mario gave freely. And even when he opened up Rhythm and Brews, the Kais would play there because it was such an audacious ask. Go to, go to, you know, people don't have money in the desert to, like, go see a live band on a Tuesday, you know what I mean? Right. Or five nights a week. It's just not happening. And so Kais would play there if things seemed like they were in trouble. Um, because I knew what he was trying to do. And, you know, people would try to skip on the tab that were his friends. You know what I mean? Jesus. We're like, dude, he's doing this thing for you. What's your problem? Um, I think there was always, there's, in the desert, there's always been this, what I call punk rock guilt, which is like, do well, but don't do too well. You know? <laughs> right. And, and I, I'm actually thankful for that, too, because it, it was a blessing in disguise. It, it teaches you to be resilient and do things because you believe in them without listening to others. Because the first request was like, sound different. And then if you sound so different that it starts to go well, people go, whoa, 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 I'm scared. And you have to be able to shirk that and say, just because you're afraid doesn't mean something scary is happening, you know? Um, and we have, you're growing or dying, you have to go forward. So when I think about Mario, I think about someone who is always given and who is, his, his, his guitar style is so beautiful his outlook is so wonderful. His, um, the way he emotes and plays, you know, I, watching him play guitar, one of the things I've always wanted is to be unhackable, <laughs> you know, where someone can look at you playing and say, I don't like it, but I know it's real. You know, there's some really intrinsic value in someone saying, it ain't for me, but I can tell this is a real motherfucker. And when I watch Mario play, I never doubted the reality of that I'm seeing, you know, yeah, he's and he's amazing. always had a way with names and every couple of years he would change the band name just for no reason, just because the music was changing a notch on the dial. And I think that really informed me about the need to blow up er early on that philosophy of to preserve it is to destroy it. So I was looking for the moment in my mind to quit Caius and I wasn't going to say I'm quitting and you guys need to quit because that's kind of a dick move, really. But I was going to—I was looking for my moment to implode my role in Caius, and it happened to be that when I, when I quit, that that the other guys quit too. But they could have gone on if they had wanted to, and I would have been like, "Go, go, man, go," you know. Um, but as it was, as I was saying before, it's so difficult to be part of a scene in the early beginnings of it. But it's even more impossible to actually start one. It's not even up to you. You know what I mean? It's like it's a luxury that you are blessed if, you, if that even gets to happen to you. Like that Stoner Rock thing, like having people say we are started that with a couple other bands is a real blessing. I never really liked the, the moniker, you know, because I felt like it boxed it in. Um, but by the same token, I was proud like a founder of that situation. But I didn't feel like, you're goddamn right I am. You know, I never felt that way. I, I, I felt like it was this, it's such a rare thing and that's so fragile. And that's why the fact that the fans have been the ones that have um, pruned and taken care of and nurtured Pius in that scene makes me so proud because you couldn't do that unless you loved it. And I got to be part of something that's like still alive because people love it for no other reason. There's no other reason. And I just think like it gives me goosebumps because it's like, <laughs> I think Josh, you lucky motherfucker, you know, like, and I, I still get to play today. <laughs> it's amazing. I, um, I kind of owe it to everybody else really. Well, the stuff you, you know? the stuff you did with Kais was some of the most important stuff of all time. I mean, it really, it, it, it really is some of the most inf most influential, most important metal I ever I don't know made. about that, but I, I think I, it is. I appreciate you saying that. I, I, I loved it. You know, I, when we started touring, what blew my mind is like we toured with like Babes in Toyland, Faith No More, White Zombie, Danzig, you know, um, the Dwarves. And I'd say, oh, do you listen to your music? And everyone would be like, fuck, no. And that blew our minds. <laughs> we were always like, Really? Because we listened to Caius religiously. I, I listened to Caius every fucking day I was in that band. If every you, fucking day. Hey, if Why? You can't, if you can't listen to your Why? music. Why? Because 
uh, because I played my favorite music that I always wanted to hear that no one else wrote, so we had to. Exactly. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, no, I tell people all the time, if you can't listen to your radio show, then nobody else can listen to it. Like, you need to, yeah, yeah you got you to gotta be doing what you like or you might as well not do it. Yeah, I mean, I, th- I always thought, like, no one told me you weren't supposed to dig your own shit. I, I, and, and I don't think it's like you don't have to jerk off in front of the mirror, but you can close your eyes, listen to the music, and be like, fuck, oh, man. Because music is above people. That's what I learned as the time went on, that music is a way to get rid of PTSD and baggage. It's a way to say you love someone when you don't know how. It's a way to explain what you can't say correctly. And it's a way to fix what's broken and a way to, like, to try to bridge gaps which cannot be bridged. And so you have to try, you know. And the older I get, the more, I, the more important. Like, I was doing it on an autopilot before, just chasing, moving at the speed of inspiration. And now I'm like, if it's not vulnerable enough, if it's not real enough, I can't do it. I just can't fucking do it. That's awesome. You know? Because what's the point? There's enough bubblegum out there, and there's nothing wrong with bubblegum, but that's just not what I'm in the business of, you know? Obviously not. Damn. You're like a philosopher, dude. You're, you're blowing my show into a whole new stratosphere. This is fucking amazing. <laughs> hey, but, but as I'm... As I, don't, I don't know about that. I, I just... I'm thankful that you're here. Oh, hell and yeah. And I'm proud to, like, be here with you guys, you know, with Nathan, and I don't know if Nathan's there, but... Well, he's listening. He, uh, we're going we're gonna to chat with him uh, in a little bit. But you know, as you're talking about all this stuff, and, and as you're moving in the in the in the direction of inspiration, you've had some incredible collaborations. You've worked with John Paul Jones. I mean, are you kidding me? Uh, Billy Gibbons. You know, all kinds of uh, amazing people. Uh, do you have like a bucket list of collaborations? Do you have something else on the horizon, or someone else you'd really love to play with? Um, I will say that, with the utmost sincerity. When the last Iggy Pop show happened, um, I went into a <laughs> deep, dark depression <laughs> because I was like, I don't need to do anything now. Right. Um, and, but that wasn't like a proud, I wasn't patting myself on the back. I was like, it was more like, what the fuck do I do? You know, how do I, being, being a soldier in Iggy Pop's band, being, being like, having him turn around, look you in the eye, and I'm like, I got you, motherfucker, with these other assassins on stage. I'll deck out in suits like we're his boys, you know, like we got you, playing those songs and, and as accurately as we could possibly do them. That was, in all honesty, like, there's been many times of, of I like turning down the money, you know what I mean? Like, if someone offers you, like, they try to buy you. I love being like, fuck that. And a lot of times you make decisions because you're following your, your heart and people say you're crazy, you know? <laughs> or you take a risk and it scares people. Or they think, you're changing, as if staying the same were better. As if copying yourself, there's no stasis. There's growing or dying. And people get afraid to grow. But the fact that the growth led all the way to getting a phone call from Mickey Pop, I was like, "No shit!" I just, it was almost like a relief, you know. Wow. And when it was over, when it was over, it was a lot like Apocalypse Now. You know? <laughs> I'd ask for a mission, and they gave me one. And when it was over, I'd never want another one again. <laughs> no <laughs> shit. Like, I, I didn't know. I was like, "What am I supposed to do?" Right. Well, um, I'm I'm happy for you that you get to do that, man. That's amazing. That's awesome. oh my god, I. I you know, I I would have made coffee just in, in the sessions with Iggy or, or John just to, like, see if I could learn something, you know. Um, and instead I got to play and learn something. So I, you know, the Iggy thing was the coolest thing I've ever been allowed to be a part of, you know. Um, so, and, and playing with Jones is just like, I, I, I asked him and, I'll preface this by saying when he gave me the answer, I felt like a total idiot. But um, I said, what, is there any instrument, <laughs> is there any instrument you do not play? And he looked at me, shrugged his shoulders, and looked at me like I was a total moron. He goes, drums. And I said, well, wait, why? And he goes, John Bond. And I just, 
That's when you're like, uh, I'm going to go get a drink. I'll be back. Yeah, Jesus Christ. What a conversation, <laughs> right? You're talking about well, John Paul Jones? It's sort of like, duh. Wow. Know? Yeah, that makes so sense. Like, hey, Josh, it, um, can you line up all your stupid questions in a row so I can <laughs> shoot one bullet through them? You know? <laughs> Yeah, trust me, I know the feeling. <laughs> so, so Josh, listen, I've had you on the on the air now for almost an hour. I mean, how you feeling? You all you all good with this? I I appreciate your time, man. This is amazing. Look, I'm happy to be here, and um, if there's something you wanted to ask, I'm here. Well, here's what I'm going to do. I, I got to get to try to. The, I'm, I'm going to run out of time. I don't think I'm going to get to the whole rest of the uh, in the Circus Leaves Town album. But you know, Black Sabbath had an incredible reunion back in 1999 uh, and they did amazing things with it. They sold out stadiums all around the world. They went crazy. And I know that you had a chat with Dean Delray and you mentioned that Led Zeppelin, they had that, you know, celebration day uh, where they reunited once and they, and they kind of did it right. You know what I mean? Seriously, Mm -hmm. would you consider some type of maybe a one-off or maybe a tour or something, some sort of Caius reunion where you guys get it all back together and try it again, even if it's just for one time? Well, um, my philosophy has always been never do a reunion, never do a sequel. It's not what it, it's not what it was, it's what it is, you know? And, and that's kind of how I felt. And I also felt like I don't ever want to, like I said, a legacy that involves having been at the epicenter of a scene that got created. It's so fragile. It's like an ice sculpture. And I don't want to be a blow dryer on that thing, you know. Um, you know, I've, I've, and and that being said, I was in full support of Kai's lives, and I would go to the shows, and I told them as much until, you know, um, what, you know, Brant and and unfortunately what John tried to do, you know, and and that was terrible because. If you don't mind, I'll actually talk about it. Yeah, let it rip. Uh, you're, you're talking about they were going to try to put out an album. Is that correct? No, what they did is I. they were sort of operating without sort of just all you have to do is like show each other respect and say, hey, we want to do this and we want to talk about it. Once Scott Reeder told me they were putting out an album, wanting to put out an album, you know, and I'm... And, uh, um, I said, let's sit down and talk. So Scott and I went and talked to John and Brent. And we had this discussion. I said, or sorry, it wasn't Brent, it was just John, because, um, you know, the band as it is, Brent had quit, and so he wasn't part of that where it was when it stopped. You know? Okay, so that makes and sense. Scott and John. And so I said, if this is a discussion for me, you, and, and, and John. And so we went and talked, and um, I said, we need we should find out a way for you guys to continue that's respectful. That you don't trample on what the legacy is and that you're kind of, that everyone understands what's going on moving forward, you know? And, you know, um, the name they chose was a little unfortunate because it's factually, literally saying Caius is alive again, which is not, wasn't my favorite thing, but I was like, oh, who cares? Okay. You know, but they were, unbeknownst to me and Scott during that meeting, they'd already applied for a trademark to steal the name away, you know, to take the name Caius. So I'm sitting there talking to these guys in good faith and their managers, and they'd already applied, and you have like 20 days to to uh, object to the application. And so the notion that I'm sitting there talking and that they are in talking good faith about how they could continue, but meanwhile at that exact moment in another room somewhere, they're applying to take the trademark for the name, Kai, so we wouldn't own it anymore. It would go, John and Brant would own it. You know what I mean? And so John felt like he was, like, he was robbing himself or something. You know what I mean? And that's just not right. I just, I don't play that way. And it also meant that they couldn't be trusted to be honest. Because I'm sitting there in the room, and instead of telling you that, it's like being stabbed in the back, essentially, you know? I can see how and, you'd be upset about that, that's for sure. Well, I just was like, there's no choice but to actually take action here because you can't sit down and say, well, let's talk about this because now you've told me that I may say something to you with my right hand, but my left hand might be 
stabbing him in the back. It, it made it impossible to trust what was going on, you know? And Scott and I both were like, Jesus. And there's only three people, me, John, and Scott. It was like, John, what are you doing? You're taking, you're taking this name with you. You're, you're allowing you and Brant to take the name from you and me and Scott. And, Scott. and, and here I was, like, sort of, like, you know, the, I suppose... I suppose at the end of the day, they did need a blessing, but I was giving it to them, you know what I mean? Like, go, I, I want those guys to do well. And they were playing Kai's music for a generation that had only heard of it and never heard it. You know, I didn't see the harm in that. But trying to usurp it and take it away was just like dirty pool, you know? Two separate things, And the, yeah. pro- the problem with all that stuff is that in a lawsuit or something like that, everyone loses, everyone looks bad. People that have loved Kai's for so long go fuck these guys you know what i mean and that's terrible that's why i say it's so fragile that's why i say i've always wanted to err on the side of don't finger bang the ice sculpture it's going to break you know makes all the sense you don't touch it it's just classic but you don't punctuate the end of a band with a lawsuit you know what I mean? right (laughs) or like those things are tragic and they're awful and and then they just, they lost because, of course, you lose when you're trying to do something like that. You know what I mean? Yeah, that makes sense. But that damage is, is awful, you know? And so, so to be honest with you and to answer your question, there have been times I've thought it cannot end that way. And the only real way to end it correctly now would be to play. I agree. And, and because um, they sort of perverted the punctuation and they knocked a wing off this beautiful dragon of an ice sculpture. And the only way to put a motherfucking wing back on would be to go, whoa, 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 whoa. Let's do <laughs> it. But, you know, that, so, you know, I have thought about this, especially in the last year, I thought, um, to do something special and, like, you know, even to make up for what that mistake of, of Brant and, unfortunately, John, like, to make up for it is like play and fucking give all the money away. You know what I mean? Like play for the fans, like play for, like cover your costs and like make it five bucks or so, you know, figure out a way to be like, this is how the punctuation will end the sentence of this band, you know? Um, because it was never about money. It never was about money. It never was about fame. And when it felt like that was the move they were making, I was so that you know no it makes sense man you you i heard you on an interview one time and you said if you ever expect anything out of playing music then you expect too much and i can i can feel that in your voice right now like exactly let's get yeah, this I mean, thing together I, let's make a huge reunion let's make it happen one time give all the money away make people happy and fucking rebuild that ice sculpt <laughs> that ice sculpture like make it yeah happen. don't 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 do it don't let them get to you and fill your head with pollution you know what i mean yeah like for what for five bucks for 20 bucks for a hundred thousand a million but what does it matter you know i mean what the fuck does it matter if you if you have something that could last forever and that actually changed something changed the way people think or or created um avenues and someone's thinking that then they went on to do something great (laughs) it's not enough you know, is that that's not enough? You know, I uh, um, I have thought about that a lot in the last year or so. You know, year and a half, and uh, I mean, maybe, maybe I, I'm. You know, I've already told you that it's traditionally my thought that never do a sequel, never do, and in order to make a band that could change so much that you never needed to break it up, that's how I. That's how I got to Queens. Like, make a band that's anything, like Ween. Anything. Yeah, Whatever you're... you think you can play, that's what it is. Yeah. And if you believe it, and it's real, then it is. Yeah, Queens is amazing. The, the personnel, the, the, the directions, oh my God. It, uh, don't, well, get, don't get it, me wrong. It's a framework that can be fleshed out in any direction. And, and so sometimes you miss, and sometimes you hit, but you're always going full on. And, and that's what Caius is doing, always going full on. The only problem is that it was it maybe painted itself into a corner, which is good that it stopped, you know? 
that that's a good that's not a bad thing that's a good thing you know but but i understand the question that's being shouldn't it shouldn't it you know breach the surface one more time i think you know? so and uh i'm starting to think that maybe it should well i think i think you're right and you know uh if i'm right you're you're 47 right now right i are I just turned 50 in January. We are not getting any younger. Oh, happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you. But but we're not getting any younger, man. Uh, and, uh, yeah, maybe. Well, that's fine. That's yeah. fine. The key is to not get any dumber. <laughs> <laughs> Josh, you have uh, basically just provided me with the greatest interview that I've ever been uh, able to do. And, um I just want to thank you. Is there anything you want to chat about? Is there anything you want to talk about before I let you go? I've had you on the phone now for well over an hour. So what do you got going on? Um, no, I, I just, um, again, I feel really pl- privileged that you guys exist, and I want to say thank you. And, um, you know, there's a lot to talk about the circus, but maybe someday we should talk again. I'd, um, love, to, I'd, love, to, I'd love to chat with you again, Josh, definitely. And I want to, I definitely have to mention Nathan. Nathan is the driving force behind Kai's World, and he is a lot like Mario where he just keeps giving out just given and given and given. He's got so much like love and so much positive energy that it's really making a difference in the, in, in this little community we have. So I can only imagine that's why you're here tonight with me. So thank you. I, I'm, I'm, I'm then I'm here directly because of the work that he's done. And I'm here because of the tending to the garden that um, is crucial to have something beautiful. And, and because of my appreciation of what you guys have done. And so I would just say thank you. Well, thank you. Know? you. And uh, thank you to Kristen, who made all this happen. I'm going to give her, uh, I'll text her my address, and if you're sending out any more Ovation Ultra GPs, you can see. You can see. <laughs> Josh, <laughs> <Three left. laughs> hey, Josh, man, thank you so much. It's great talking to you. I'm going to try to rip the, re- the most of the, uh, the rest of the record I can, and thanks for visiting us, man. I appreciate it. You got it. Thank you so much. No Have problem. Ladies and gentlemen, Bye. Josh Hami from Caius World Radio.
fucking all unbelievable. Hey, this is Nick Alberry, and you're listening to PJ Boston on Caius World Radio. <laughs> chat with Nathan Lover pretty soon. But first we got some more Kai's. Look at that. Would you look at that? Filthy. Absolutely filthy. Yeah. Yeah, put it in Hell yeah. That's what I like about you, baby. You're always 
always on time.
my god i can't even believe that we're almost done with our show i um i gotta i think my good friend nathan is finger banging an ice sculpture in wisconsin right now nathan are you there wait a minute let me see if i can figure this out nathan are you there yeah <laughs> damn i got people laughing in the background and shit what are you guys having a party in wisconsin no no all right just checking it hey uh so hey we did an interview a little bit earlier did you catch it i talked to uh josh from uh caius oh shit there was a radio show now? yeah i know you missed it oh damn it <laughs> <laughs> no nah, man uh what do you think of all that nathan oh that was awesome pj pj boy <laughs> that i that was really i i don't know how do we uh how do i even talk no you know what? It's about journalism, man. It's about, you know, I, I got to admit, I take a little page of Joe Rogan's thing. Like, let's not rush through yeah. this. Let's not play commercials. Let's not uh, change the subject. Let's dig. Let's dig in. See what we got. That was, it was amazing. Honestly, you did a great job, PJ. Thank and, you. And uh, I'm really super stoked for this. I mean, just to have Josh on the show was amazing. But then the, the content of the interview and, and he was just, willing to talk about anything is super it was amazing yeah really it was yeah it was really great very thoughtful and uh it was really nice to hear him talk about uh all the different the, the people that we've already talked to and all that you know it's like uh to hear the reverence he has for chris goss and for uh for mario and, and for some of the guys in the desert scene it's great and i love the fact that he's at a spot right now where he thinks you know what maybe the best thing would be a nice fat set of Caius live somewhere so yeah and and i like the way that he put it to not the finger banging the uh ice sculpture thing but right um just the, that that would be the best way to to end it right you know i don't think that any of those guys hate each other you know what i mean I think that they were young and they're doing their thing and they're just all artists and they're amazing and all of them have been you know, so generous with us and everything. I don't know. I just, I feel like, I feel like now's the time. Maybe it's coming. And, you know, everyone has been really great about doing the show and, and about Caius world in general. Everyone has really taken us under their wing. And, you know, I just, I'm speechless, honestly. Clearly. PJ. Yeah, no, it's uh, got a lot of attention on social media, I'll tell you that. So uh, it was a pretty nerve-wracking interview for me, just because I've never t talked to someone as big of a rock star as that. But he uh, you know, he, I, made I it, he, he made it he made it easy. He made it exactly, exactly. He uh, he likes to talk, and especially about stuff that he's passionate about. I mean, that's kind of why we're all here. We love to talk about what we love. And it's it's easy to have a conversation when when you have that common ground with people. Yeah. We all love music, and and everyone associated with the scene loves music. So it's just it couldn't have gone much better than that, honestly. All right, listen, I got about five minutes left. So here's what we're gonna do: Step one, get rid of COVID. Step two, plan the Caius reunion. <laughs> There you go. It, two easy steps to salvation right there. Amazing. Good. All right. So listen, I'm going to play a cover tune, a Yawning Man cover tune by Caius. I'm going to say thank you and uh, congratulate you because that worked out really, really well for all of us. And uh, Caius World, man, it lives. It lives. Caius World, baby. Are you ready? Yeah. Nathan, have a great night, man. Thank you. You too, buddy. Peace out, brother.
we're coming down the stretch here on Kai's World Radio. Unfortunately, we just only have so much time. I got a, uh, I got my good friend Antho in the house. Antho, yo, 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 yo. What's hey man, up? you got some shout outs, man. You want to say what's up to little Sadie, little so, Lucy? I want to say hi to my wife Alicia. Alicia, she's taking care of little Lucy at home, and uh, hopefully she remembered to feed Sadie the dog. But, yeah, uh, is Sadie barking at the neighbors, waking up the kid? Yeah, is but that the plan? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hey, here we go. We're going to start some spaceship landing. So shout out to who? What we got? Uh, Mike. Mike, uh, Nick, my mom, dad. Oh, I love your parents, man. The rest of Jack Shaft who are not here. Sean Miss and you Sean. guys. I've yeah. not seen you guys since fucking February. I miss those guys, too. Man. All right, yeah. listen, listen, I got a big list of people I got to shout out to. Uh, hey, we should shout out to Marwan, too. I love you, Marwan. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, Josh Homme. Thank you a million times over. Kristen, Josh's publicist. Kristen's amazing, and she has not been giving herself enough credit lately. I officially love Kristen, by the way. Nathan Lover, the chairman of the board, figuring this shit all out. My good friend Mark Lewis. Mark, I didn't even get to get through the whole Caius album, but everyone should go find Gloom by Mark Lewis. You can find it on YouTube. You can find it all over the place. But Mark Lewis has a new song called Gloom. It's sick, and I wish I could play it. I'm going to play it next week. I want to shout out to my good friend Margarita Polskina. Margarita is so nice to me and so awesome and has always been a big supporter. And Godspeed to you, sweetheart. We love you. We're praying for you. And I got your back. Uh, Jamie Lee Wood, Luke Tyson, Garth, my man Butterfield Hall. Butterfield, I wish I could get some heavy blazer on, but I'm running out of time. The lovely Kara. Kara is the best. And I played uh, played some Kai's for her earlier. Uh, and, of course, her lovely husband, Frank. All of the admins, Hoffy, Jorge, Chavez, Hartley, Michael, William, Petri, our good friend Jason Hall and his lovely wife, Iris, um, Racer Dan, Johnny C. whipping his hair back and forth, um, just everybody who makes Caius World happen. I want to thank everybody so much. Tonight's been an amazing night for me, but listen, I promise you, it'll be next Sunday at 6 p.m. before you know it, yo. 